wanted to welcome you. Oh. And I should probably wait for the recording to be in progress. So now that our recording is in progress, let me start from the top. So again, good afternoon and welcome to everyone here. We'd like to welcome you to this joint collaboration between the California Virtual Camp Senat One and OERI. We're really excited to present to you Open Education Resources and Integration in Peer Online Course Review. We have three wonderful facilitators with us today, Sochi Trado with CBC at One, Suzanne Joaquim with OERI, and also facilitator at at One, and Michelle Pilotti with OERI. I just want to turn it over to them briefly to maybe say a few words about yourself and introduce you all to the crowd before I continue. I'll go ahead and start. Hi, everyone. My name is Sochi Tirado, and I am a faculty um, Oh, I forgot my title. Uh, I'm, uh, sorry. Um, I, I'm basically here for faculty. Um, I'm part of CVC uh, at one, and um, I'm also a distance education coordinator at Imperial Valley College. It's very nice to be here and very nice to see everyone. Here, I'll go ahead and go. Hi, good afternoon, Michelle Pilati. I'm the project director for the Academic Senate's Open Educational Resources Initiative. Um, and I, I hope we have a mix of people who, people who know Suzanne and I, and then people who know uh, Sochi and Brandon, and so that we are actually bringing together two um, populations of faculty that no, don't necessarily always interact. And we're going to try to be sensitive to that and, and make sure that we're defining terms that um, each of us use so that uh, no one gets lost along the way. So welcome. We're glad to have you here. Hi, I'm uh, Suzanne Joaquim. I am one of the project facilitators for the OERI, and I also facilitate for At One. Welcome. Thank and you all. Oh, sorry, what you said. So thank you all for introducing yourself. A couple of just logistical notes here. During the webinar, we'll be linking you to a survey to provide feedback. For those of you that have attended our spring webinar series with CBC at one, you know that we have a survey distributed through that. That also means that that while our at one facilitated courses tend to offer badges for completion, we don't do that for our webinar series. However, for those of you that are using this for flex credit at your institution, the survey should serve as a proof of completion as long as you check the box that says send your result of the survey. If for some reason that doesn't work for your institution, please email support at cbc.edu and I'll be placing that in the chat shortly along with the survey throughout the webinar. Email us at support, and we can usually furnish some documentation that's been able to serve people that need to do this for flex credit. Also, the webinar will, will be recorded, and a copy will be available on the CBC at one site. Usually within a week, we want to make sure that, of course, it's accessible and properly captioned, along with the associated slides. Lastly, during the webinar, we know that a lot of you will have questions. Please feel free to put those in the chat. Periodically, I'll be interjecting at the request of the facilitators to bring some of the questions to light. So let's hopefully have a robust discussion and an equally fascinating webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful facilitators and we'll get this started. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so Chief, we could go to the next slide. So that's the title. And what the... Um, what the goal of this session is, is to look at how we can create uh, online courses that include OER linked in Canvas in a way that is accessible and um, using the best practices of the CBC rubric. So we're, that's where the crossover is happening, right? Is that how do you bring OER into your distance ed class in a way that is effective and accessible? Okay, uh, next slide. I think we've already introduced ourselves. So let's go ahead to the overview of uh, the session. So we're gonna start with a little bit of introduction and defining the terms poker and OER. There's a lot of acronyms being tossed about in academia, so we will define our terms. Then we'll look at uh, different ways to integrate OER into Canvas. You can um, embed it, you can copy and paste, there's all sorts of different options. So we will look at all the different ways to add OER content into Canvas. And we'll also be discussing uh, the accessibility and usability of the different strategies for adding OER. And then we'll have time for questions and conclusions. Although, um, as Brandon mentioned, if you have questions, please do post them in the chat and we are, we're happy to answer them as we move along. 
Okay, so I think the next slide is definition of terms. So I will turn it over at this point. I'll go ahead and start um, telling you a little bit about POKER and what POKER is. So POKER is part of CBC at One. It stands for Peer Online Course Review. Um, we provide resources for colleges, including professional development for course design, assistance with establishing local college review teams, which includes training and professional development specifics uh, specific to course review. We also work with all colleges to help um, them become local poker certified uh, colleges. Um, so essentially, uh, poker stands for um, it's it's a it's a way to review courses, review online courses, and make sure that they meet specific standards. We have a rubric that we use. So um, with CBC at One and Poker, we provide a lot of professional development in helping colleges form teams. Um, a lot of those teams get training, and that even includes faculty training, faculty that are um, creating the courses um, so that they can be delivered online. Um, so we have a CBC course design rubric, which establishes standards related to course design, interaction, coll and collaboration, assessment, learner support, and accessibility. So those are the, the things that that uh, rubric um, hits on. And with POKER, that's how we're able to create a process for colleges to uh, review their courses. So I get to defi de define OER and I actually decided that I don't like the definition that's there. So I'm actually gonna give you a different definition. Um, open educational resources, we always like to stress the O is for open, not online, but in order to deliver them easily and freely to your students, they probably are very often online. And open educational resources can be anything where you have taken it and said, other people can do things with it that you normally can't do with copyrighted resources. So if you create something, it has a copyright, and then you have the option of putting an open license on it that allows others to do things with it, completely change it, um, maybe you limit what they can do with it and so forth. And so there's a whole range of open licenses that we won't get into. But for our purposes here, when we're talking about OER, we are talking about resources that you can use freely, you can adapt them, you can modify them, you can bring them into your courses in whatever way um, you want. And so those are the kind of things that we're talking about and specifically talking about bringing um, OER textbooks and other resources into the Canvas space um, in order to teach your courses at low or no cost to students. Next slide, please. So the introduction here is sort of what brought us here. Why did um, CBC at one and OERI say, hey, let's do a webinar together? There's a bunch of different reasons. Um, it makes sense for us to co-present on a number of different ways. We all are focused on how do we serve our students in the most effective way possible, whether you're using OER, whether you're teaching online without OER, how do you do it well? And we're both the same in that we are working with all the California community colleges. We're not just working with a couple of colleges. We really strive to reach out to all the, all the colleges across the system. And so why not team up where we have um, shared interests to talk to the populations that come to our webinars and maybe start to try and find more opportunities for crossovers between the work that we're doing. Next one, please. Um, it also makes it so that we are delivering similar messages. Um, we don't want to, for the OERI to be saying one thing and then at one to be saying something different. And sometimes we hear that those things are happening. And that was really kind of what brought this conversation together because we were hearing things that didn't make sense. Um, and so it made sense to come together and to talk at the same time about a topic that we all care about. Next slide, please. Um, really, really importantly, we heard lots of concerns and misconceptions about poker and accessibility when using OER. So that was sort of the driving force, something that we kept on hearing things about that made it so that we said, let's come together and do a webinar um, and address these things. And you're going to discover that it's very little about accessibility. It's more about poker and OER and that particular um, intersection. Next one. Um, the big question that I keep asking myself is why didn't we do this sooner? So the hope is that this is the first. And and I really sincerely do hope that we have people who don't normally go to at one webinars in, in the room and people who don't normally go to OERI, OERI webinars in the room 
And I know there's some of you who go to everything anyway, so we're glad to have you guys as well. Next slide, please. And this is back to Sochi. That's me, yeah. All right, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about the CBC course design rubric, which I mentioned a little bit uh, before when I introduced poker. Um, so the CBC course design rubric establishes online course design standards. Uh, certain elements in the rubric touch on embedding content like OER and online courses. Uh, I want to make sure that we make it really clear to tell you all that it is possible to embed OER in Canvas and still have your course be aligned to the CVC course design rubric standards. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about throughout uh, this presentation. Um, so one of the elements um, in the CVC course design rubric um, that um, embedding content where, where it's talked about is A9, instructions for learners. So this uh, specific, specific element asks for instructors to include clear instructions for embedding content. This includes links to external websites, videos, and things like OERs. Um, for this rubric element to be aligned, clear instructions that tell the learner why the content is being provided, what the learner should keep in mind as they watch or read the content, what information should the learner gain from the content, and when learners should use the content. All of that kind of information should be included. Uh, so when embedding an OER in, in Canvas, in, a, in an online course, you, we need to provide clear instructions for the student. So the student needs to know where that link is gonna take them or what that link is gonna open and what they should look for. So that's one of the rubric elements um, to consider. Um, another one is this one, D3, uh, descriptive links. Since most screen readers and um, talking browsers scan a web page for all the links and then create an alphabetized list of them for the user, having links, uh, a link text that provides a clear description um, of the page that will load for the student to see um, is the best practice. So giving a clear description of that link. Um, when embedding OERs, always use descriptive links and keep the keywords consistent throughout the course so that students can easily identify when they will open their OER textbook. So anytime you're embedding, for example, a chapter of the OER textbook or anything, you know, any other or any other kind of instructional material um, that you know is related to OER, make sure that 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 the title that you give to that link make sense and keep it consistent throughout because that'll make it easier for students to know, like, oh, this is going to open a chapter of a book or an article I have to read, you know, some content related aspect of the course. And then um, this is OER information and location. So in most courses, um, when we design an online course, most of us design a module zero. It's either called a module zero or a course orientation module. Um, so this module usually introduces the students to the course. It includes student support, campus resources, um, information about the course, like grading, participation, and anything else. It's common for this module to also include information about the textbook. Um, so this is a good place to put that information about the OER in the course in module zero. Uh, for example, a best practice would be to include a page in module zero that introduces students to the OER textbook. This page can also include information about where they will find the weekly readings and any other pertinent information about the book. Um, some instructors even include this as a standalone module. Um, so besides the module zero, they have a standalone module that's just for the OER information. Um, the module includes an explanation of the book, link to the entire book, and even a table of contents if applicable. Um, so any information that the student will need um, about that OER that's going to be linked in the course. Both options are acceptable for um, the CBC course design rubric alignment. The key to alignment is making sure that a clear explanation is given to students about the OER that's going to be embedded in the course. Um, how to navigate that textbook or those links, where to find them, and keeping consistency in the way that the readings are organized throughout the course. So whatever way you decide to put those readings in there, just keep it consistent throughout the entire course so that it makes sense to students. 
And then finally, I just want to reiterate that we are here working together, you know, presenting this information to you to tell you all that um, using OER in your online courses um, can result in an aligned course with the CVC course design rubric. So if you've heard anything different, um, you know, we're here to present this information. We're here to present some best practices about how to embed that content into your course and your course will be aligned with the CVC course design rubric. And that's it. All right, I will um, take it from here. So as, um, as Sochi mentioned, what we're gonna look at today are different ways to put the OER content into your Canvas course so that you still align with the rubric. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. So these are all options you have and um, you, you can decide which one works best for your course and your design. Um, but we just wanted to present the full breadth of the options. Uh, those are, so I'm just going to list them and then we'll talk about them individually. So you can link out to the book. You can copy the book into a Canvas page. And remember, you can cut and paste from OER because they've already allowed for those um, that use, right? So something that's fully copyrighted. We didn't mention this, but we should. Maybe I will now. A fully copyrighted textbook from a, a, a for-profit publisher, you cannot cut and paste into Canvas. Um, without breaking copyright, but with OER, you can't. So that's another one. Then we'll look at embedding and there's different ways to embed. And then we'll look at um, a really neat way to get the book into the Canvas navigation menu with a little bit of a hack, something to look forward to. Okay, so let's start with linking out. And one way that you can, um, so, Deborah, great question in the chat about if you cut and paste directly, will the text update if changes are made? It will not. That's one of the downsides to cutting and pasting. If you embed, then what what, what in effect an embed is, it's a, a iframe to the live page. So if something is changed on the page, it automatically shows that new page on your course. If you cut and paste, it's all yours. You know, the upside is you can um, change it without changing the original, but the downside is you have to change it. So great question. So for linking out, there's two different ways that you can, um, two different places that I think it makes sense to link out. One is on um, a page where you're describing what you're, what the students are doing in the unit, right? This may be your, your welcome page. I call mine's the goals page. Um, you might have your video, short little video of, you know, welcome to week three to, you know, we're doing this. And so in that sort of a page, you might have a list of tasks, right? In this module, we will do these four things. And as part of that list, you have a link to the book. And you can see here that's item one. Chapter three is the link to chapter three of the textbook. And this is what, um, what Sochi was talking about with A9 right? You don't just want to have random links tossed onto a page. Context is the most important thing. And that's what we're doing here. You're explaining to students what they're doing while they're reading the book. Okay, so that's one way. You can also link out to the book as part of the assignment, right? So before it was like the intro page to the module, this is actually the assignment that students are doing. You can see the text at the bottom says the assignment, the rest of that would follow. And what what's, what's useful about this is it gives students context um, very directly, like read chapter three, and it's very clearly linked that chapter three will help you do this assignment. So this is another way to another nice way to link out while providing context. Okay, so cutting, uh, copy and pasting. So Deborah, this is back to your question. You absolutely can copy and paste, and this is um, literally me copying and pasting text into a Canvas editor, although you can't really tell from the picture, but that's what you're looking at. The downsides are, as, as you mentioned, if somebody edits the original book to fix typos, to do, you know, clean up, whatever it might be, those updates don't show in your 
um, in your page. And this takes a fair bit of work. It's a lot of cutting and pasting, and I have to make sure the headings are right, the alt text carried over, and all of these things. So it takes it takes a lot of work. Um, I generally wouldn't recommend this unless there's a specific reason. Like I have a, a colleague that does this, and it's because she has her main book that is used for different classes. And she pulls sections out for each of the individual individualized classes and edits a little bit to make those cleaner. So that's a really good example of when you want to copy and paste is because you're making edits. And what's nice about this strategy is it flows for students, right? So they might get the, the welcome page for the module, then the copy and paste of the textbook. So welcome page, then the textbook, then the assignment. That makes sense to students. And you can also add a little um, description at the top of this page telling students whatever, you know, as you read the below, think about X, Y, and Z, which wouldn't make sense in, um, in an externally linked textbook. So that's um, some of the options. Uh, with that, we're gonna switch over to embedding options and I'm gonna turn it back to Michelle. All right, so embedding. So in em embedding, there's different ways to embed, and I think that's important to recognize, and it might even be a term that you don't hear a lot. So you can embed and do it so that you're populating a Canvas page. Um, and that's what um, what Deborah was asking about. If you're looking at LibreText, which is a basically an OER publisher, you could take content out of LibreText and copy and paste it into a page, and then it would no longer live in LibreText. But if you embed the page, then it still lives in LibreText and you could be pulling from a book that somebody else is updating or you're updating it and the content is being delivered to multiple classes, even at multiple colleges that you're teaching or you and other people. Um, and we put into the PowerPoint some links to um, how to do this um, and just to show you how easy it is to move from LibreText, something from LibreText and then to embed it in Canvas. It's super easy to do. Um, the video I think is, maybe three minutes and the, um and it's very very simple um and then and then there's also a text a, a text explanation you can also embed content within a canvas page so, so next slide please so um if you're populating a canvas page this is what it looks like so you have your normal canvas excuse me your normal canvas uh, menu on the left and then in the page you have the content that is coming from your embedded textbook. And again, this is LibreText, and so you see all the same options. If you were within LibreText, you see all the same options um, on the page there. Next slide, please. So some pluses and minuses here. We thought, uh, and, and, and it's funny, as I was thinking about it, some of the things that we think are pluses, some people might think are minuses and vice versa. So maybe we should have just put them without, without um, an attribution there, but a, a big plus um, if the um, the OER content is there within Canvas, the students are not leaving the course to go someplace else, like when you're linking out, um, even though the content that they're seeing actually lives someplace else. Um, at the same time, the provided content, co provided context that you can put above or after above the um, content doesn't actually live on the same page as the OER. Um, so you can put it, you can put your embedded page can be preceded by, by preliminary information. You could have your embedded content and then it can be followed by follow-up information that's separate from the textbook, however you want to do it. Um, and so th that could be perceived as a minus depending on how you want to do things. Um, another plus though, is that the previous and the, the um, navigation within Canvas is, it's maintained, it still works. Um, and then also the canvas, excuse me, the navigation within the embedded page also works. So if a student's very comfortable with the navigation in Canvas, they can continue to use that. But if they want to use the navigation within the embedded OER, they can also use that. And that sounds really confusing, but when you're actually in the space, it makes sense. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and then you can embed, embed content within a, a Canvas page. Um, and this, so this was, this is more, instead of having the entire page, you have the, um, you've got the module three readings, read chapter three of the textbook here, which is lives on a canvas page. And then you actually have 
the LibreText content embedded on the page. We did not bring a bad example of this, but there are some really bad examples. If you have a lot of content, content or context preceding an embedded page and that embedded page is big, it becomes very cumbersome. And while it might be completely technic technically accessible, whether or not it's usable becomes um, becomes a big issue. And we had a really Wish. good example of how not to do it, which we probably yeah. should have bought, but you probably have seen those things. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, we have a question in the chat from Ellie that says, isn't it accessible, accessibility best practice is to embed into a Canvas page? So from an accessibility, so that's a really good question. So from an accessibility standpoint, that's a great big, it depends. So I because of the questions and concerns about embedding and accessibility in Canvas, we were hearing those so much. I met with the Accessibility Center and wound up me and like five or six people from the Accessibility Center. And what they told me very simply was that um, if the content that you're embedding is accessible, you're 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 good, right? So you need to actually. Look, well, we're going to talk more about this later. Um, but if you are embedding content within a Canvas page, you run into those usability components. And and I hadn't even gotten into the. It, it, I I asked them specifically about that and that kind of bad example where you have like this this kind of like scrolling page mm -hmm. embedded within a page. Um, you run into usability things. So. It's just as it, it may be just as accessible, but whether or not it's usable is something that I really think you have to really sit back and um, and um, think about. The example yeah. that we saw was one of embedding um, in, embedding some um, Canvas guide within a page, and so you're embedding to you know Canvas resources that are kind of complicated in and of themselves uh, in and of themselves. And it's very easy to see that it might be technically accessible, but it's just not usable. And I think a follow-up that Ellie has there, Sochi, you might be able to pitch into this. Uh, she further elaborated on her question to say, is it a best practice so the student doesn't have to leave the campus environment? And I think from the poker perspective, that's a point of confusion that often comes up. So I don't know if Michelle or Suzanne or even Sochi wanted to speak a little bit more towards that. Yeah, so I do, it is best practice to have students stay within Canvas, you know, that way they're not leaving somewhere else and then will they come back to the course or will they wander off? So in that sense, yes, it is a best practice to embed it. But I think as Michelle mentioned, you know, it depends on the type of resource that you're embedding. Um, because of the scrolling and all of that. But definitely we want to keep them within Canvas as much as we can. But Which, just yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Oh, and I just wanted to clarify too, so she definitely a best practice, do it to the extent that we can, but hard and fast rule, yeah or nix, I think that's a point of confusion for a number of people. Yeah. So I kind of put you on the spot there, I know. <laughs> no, so yes, yes. The hard and fast rule is yes. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 the 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 benefit with embedding is while the student is on a page of content that lives some that actually is maintained someplace else, it is within Canvas. So they're not leaving Canvas. It's it's sort of um a workaround, if you will, for lack of a, a better term. Anything more, Brandon? Just an addition from Megan and that are say that I would like to add that keeping a student in Canvas is a separate issue from accessibility. Right. That's totally right, right. Ellie. Yes, de definitely right. Different than like accessibility. We're talking more of um, the user experience living within Canvas is best. Yes. Yep. UDL concept. Yes. All right. Thank you all for answering those questions and as well as my little curveball there. <laughs> Good, it keeps us fresh. So embedding within a Canvas page, oops, pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses. If you're doing the embedding within a page, the OER content um, is existing within Canvas, even though it's embedded, the students aren't leaving. Um, another plus, the provided context can live on the same page as the OER, so they're not gonna accidentally skip the context and dive right in without getting that introduction. Um, again, a plus previous and next buttons in Canvas can be used or the navigation fe features within the embedded page. 
Uh, and then a minus, usability issues can occur when there's a lot of context and a lot of information in the iframe. So that little piece. Next slide, please. All right, here is the the um, the hack that Suzanne mentioned. She told me about this and I was like, wait a minute, that is too cool. Um, there's something called a redirect tool in Canvas that allows you basically to add something to the menu on the left. So if you wanted to take a textbook that you were using or another resource that you wanted students to have ready access to, you can actually have it go over and live in that left-hand menu. Um, Suzanne told me about it. I went and did a search and good old Yale came up with just perfect directions. They're, they'll be in the PowerPoint, super easy to use. It took no time and all of a sudden I had my textbook in the menu. So next slide, please. When you add it, it just, it puts it at the very bottom of your menu. So you have to move it up. And now you see there, I have lifespan development text right there on my homepage. So students who log in are like, where's the text? What do I do for the text? It's right there. Um, I just did this for the first time. I'm a week, I'm almost two weeks into my class. And my students are obviously reading the textbook and finding the textbook, even though I put it in front of them in so many ways. They are there. It appears, it appears, I haven't done it, dug into the data to find out for sure, but it appears that they are finding the textbook and diving into it in a way that they had never um, done so before. Next slide, please. Um, and so here's what here's what you see there. They basically then get the uh, this is like the the basically the table of contents contents in the textbook that they could click on and see everything at once, which is particularly useful if the student knows what where they want to go. Um, they don't have to go into a module and find that particular chapter. They can just click on their book, go right into exactly where they want to go, um, and it's right there. So it's um, uh, it's really a, a pretty cool thing. And Suzanne pointed out that it's a hack in, in that this is not what you're supposed to do with it, but it, it works quite nicely. <laughs> and Lindsay in the chat actually has a helpful note here and saying that a note about the redirect tool, double check when you roll over a course to the next term, she's had it show up as a broke, they've had it show up as a broken link before. So we all know to do our due diligence, but sometimes when we're importing a ton of content, that's one of those things that can slip through the cracks. And in the event that it does it, you know, our students, I'm sure, will let us know about that very promptly. <laughs> what a great reminder. Thank you for that. And yeah. this may be worth pointing out that, you know, Canvas has that validate link, which is just magic, um, because then then you can just run it all at once and see see what happened. Yeah. And so back to the pluses and minuses here, the plus, it reminds students that they do have a text. The student who is not paying a lot of attention. Wait, there it is. I have a text. A minus, if you have your course structured so that students aren't able to get to the next module until they've completed one prior, um, and that that textbook is embedded in there and you don't want them to get there before they've seen something else, it could allow students to bypass content um, that you may want them to read. Uh, a plus, it allows students an easy way to access the entire textbook, um, which I think is, is really quite useful because I could imagine as a student going in and saying, oh, I have to get a print version of that particular chapter and not being clear how to do it when they're within modules. But if they actually go to the book, it's super obvious. How do you how do you print a chapter? Um, and a minus, um, students could forget that the link is in the menu. So, but it's that's just one of several places that it's provided. Um, uh, again, with that, making sure that students can get, can find what they need. Um, it's just one more place to um, get that information to them. Next slide, and I think this is back to Suzanne. So one of the considerations for embedded content, and so there's lots of really great discussion happening about um, the benefits of embedding content, especially have it on a page where you can provide the context um, above what they're reading. And again, the, the point of caution is not to have too much of the context on the page and then having the the embedded stuff way low because then it gets to be cluttery. So you just want to, you know, a nice little paragraph and then the embedded content. If you, we, yeah, go ahead. 
We did have seen a point of clarification from Deborah in the chat who asks, I embed the entire textbook using the URL in the orientation module, so I'm confused why you want to redirect. Or is anyone here able to clarify why we would situations which we would utilize that redirect if we are indeed doing something like Deborah does and embedding it in the orientation module? Well, I would I would say that having it in that menu where it's kind of in front of the student's face as opposed to within a module, it kind of um, it kind of puts it front and center. Um, but I, I mean, I, I'm all for figuring out as many different places where they can get to it so that so that what you know whatever works for that student they can find it. Um, but right. but I, I I I you know I often get the questions: Do we have to buy a textbook? Even though I explain up front that you don't have to buy a textbook. No one has asked me that this term. It's the first term that I have not had one student ask me. Um, and so I think having it there on the homepage um, in that menu that they look to for things um, has, has value. I would also add another point to that too, Michelle, that despite our best efforts at having our classes poke our line, there are still students that navigate through a course by clicking on the to-do list and completely bypassing modules. As a student, I've been guilty of it myself, but that's because I know how to operate it. But I'll click on those moments and go, right, I need to go back and look in the module. So something about having it in that left navigation makes it more visible, having it in as many places as possible. So I definitely get where Deborah is coming from. And well, if I'm doing this in here, isn't it there? And it is. But for those people that despite our best efforts and sirens avoid the modules initially, that's another place they can find it. Um, yes, redundancy is is really helpful for students because they everyone's brains works a little bit differently and they they navigate and think through things differently. So having a few different options is is helpful. Um, one of the shouldn't say cautions, but something that you should be aware of with embedding content is the Canvas accessibility checker does not check the content within the iframe. So the embedded content, the way to check that is to go to the original link and run a wave check and check the accessibility there. And then once, once you know the page is accessible, when you iframe in, you know it's accessible because the iframe won't change the accessibility for, for better or worse, it just keeps it. So you wanna make sure the original page is accessible because Canvas Accessibility Checker does not check that. And I think that's also true for the Pope Tech Checker is it doesn't check iframes. Um, although I'm not sure, but I did want to mention Pope Tech just because it's fabulous and all our campuses get it for free and it's so much more powerful than the Canvas Checker. So if you haven't heard about Pope Tech, um, reach out to your, your DE folks, distance ed folks, and ask them about this really amazing, powerful tool for checking accessibility. But regardless, for embedded content, you want to go to the external link. Um, and I think that was it. So the last point we already made is there's a difference between accessibility and usability, right? Just because it's technically accessible, it could be very confusing to navigate. So, you know, as Michelle mentioned, if you have too much stuff on a page, it's cluttery. And I think that's one of the um, rubric elements, but I, I don't have them memorized. <laughs> so not too much stuff on the page. Excellent. Okay, so um, I think the next slide is just questions. We've been answering questions as we move along, but now is a great time to ask questions. Yeah, let's open up. Let's open up the floor. Uh, hi. Hi, Dinesh. Hi. So I just wanted to quickly mention um, for accessibility, uh, when you do embed the text. You, the immersive reader that's in Canvas, uh, you can run it through there to make sure that uh, it reads well uh, as well. Um, and, and if it doesn't, uh, then you can go ahead and make those adjustments as well. That's clever. Thank you for, for sharing. I did not know that. Thank you. We have a, Ying has her hand raised. What was your question, Ying? Hi. Um... I'm one of those people who 
is in both spaces. So it's actually really good to see everybody coming together uh, for this webinar. Um, it, I don't know if it's exactly a question, but I think early on, Suzanne, um, when you were talking about um, copy and pasting, um, and you were actually saying that you don't necessarily recommend uh, doing that. And I just want to use an example in one of our online course review. It wasn't even in poker, it was just you know online training. Uh, we had an instructor, history instructor who actually did that. So she copied and pasted every single page in, you know, of the OER textbook into a Canvas page, which is a lot of work. Uh, but then she got into trouble, not with the, the text, but there's footnote. And within the footnote, there are a lot of naked links. So they end up having an argument between the faculty and uh, the reviewer, um, our online trainer, uh, because the online trainer said, oh, these naked links are not, are not accessible. Uh, but then she said, well, that's industry standard because in history, you know, that's that particular journal and that journal is using naked links. So it's just kind of another warning I guess about you know copying and pasting, and sometimes the inaccessibility can come from like unexpected corner. Yeah, that's it. That's an interesting one. We we've run into that with some of the OER we created, um, where you know citation MLA Chicago whatever APA you're using have very rigid rules, and as someone that doesn't like any of the citation formats. Um, I just want to just be like, ah, you guys are just too, too rigid, right? Because you have to have the full URL, which is just stupid. But there it is. That's the rule. Um, and so the the accessibility fix for that, and this is true for anytime you have the full URL, is to make sure it's not an active link, because then it's treated as a word and the screen reader can just, you can click over to the next word. Um, whereas if it's a link, that's all the information you have. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, and then that's ideally, if, if you could also, and I'm just thinking through, if if the, the citation format allows you to make the title a clickable link, that's the best of both worlds. But I don't know if that breaks the citation rules or not. Thank you so much, Suzanne. We just ran into that issue um, I was trying, to, I was doing a section D evaluation for a class and uh, the instructor was doing a citation and had the full HTML link. And I was, you know, trying to be like, no, we got to change it. So it's, you know, in context and you don't want the screen reader to announce the whole, H you know, the whole HTML link. And so, no, that's the way you're supposed to do it for the citation. So we just ran into that issue. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one because you have two two standards butting up against each other. Um, and while I would imagine federal standards when um, I, I get that the citation format doesn't. So hopefully this is a good um, halfway point so that we can do both of them justice. We have other questions since you have the benefit of having both CBC and poker here and OERI. We've got 15 minutes left, so you've had burning questions about either. I see that Che has his hand up. Che, want to unmute yourself? Yeah, great to be here. Happy Thursday, everyone, all of you education nerds. I love these spaces. Um, the blending of Canvas and poker, it's super great conversation. I'm, I'm, so I'm, I adopted OER for interpersonal communication and um, the challenge I'm having, because I've, I've been using the same book for really the last 15 plus years, and now I'm doing this OER, is blending in the OER um, with the module. I created a module um, re course readings page, and then I, I link it to the OER. But the challenge for me is um, how do I direct the student to a specific aspect of the OER? while still giving them the holistic textbook feel of, you know, to explore the entire book. Like, I, I don't want to be the kind of dictator that says, read what I tell you to read, um, but I want to give student the, students the experience to explore the OER in its entirety. So any thoughts on the maintaining the fluidity of the textbook, 
but also a consistency and access points um, within the modules. Thank you. So, Shu, do you want to maybe speak to that one a little bit? Yeah. I have some thoughts too, but let's see. Sure. So I think I think you can kind of do a little bit of both. You could you could embed the entire textbook as as was mentioned with that redirect link or uh, in that module zero, as somebody else mentioned, that they include the URL for the for the entire text in their module zero, and then within the modules. Then you direct students to read specific chapters, uh, specific, you know, that are that are specific to that module, the content that you're presenting in that module, and then link those chapters in there. Um, that, that's just one thought off, off the top of my head. Brandon, you mentioned you had something, another idea, maybe? Yeah, I mean, you stole a lot of my good ideas, oh, but really they're, no, really, they're your ideas. I was probably stealing them from you, but seriously, in conjunction with that, I think some of that comes with the communication that we have with our students. So Sochi mentions, you can embed the entire textbook. You can have it in module zero. You can also have the chapters there. But I suspect that as you're communicating with your students week to week, either through announcements or through office hours, some variation of a message of, well, I have the textbook in multiple places. I'm not trying to be overly prescriptive of the reading. If you ever want to read ahead, I fully encourage you to do that. Reading multiple times will just help further cement the information. So I think it's getting out of that mindset of sometimes, okay, we put the link here. They're only ever going to read it that one time and really encouraging them to engage with the reading, which is part of the course material, just in multiple times and multiple ways. But I hear your point about I don't want to dictate that okay, read chapter one, pages three to five, being so prescriptive about it that it kind of kills that exploration. But it's that balance between that and contextualizing because no textbook is 100% perfect. I usually say some of the fact of, hey, I encourage you to read all of it, but in particular for this week, these sections are pertinent to what we're going to be discussing in the material that we're going to be covering. And, and I would... oh, oh, sorry, no, Michelle. Let's go. Yeah, I would also ask um, where where the resource is, and do you have the ability to to break it up? So when when we're we, we since we're, we focus on LibreText, which allows which brings an entire chapter of LibreText into a module, but it's broken down, so you can you could direct a student to a particular part within that module. Um, and I also back to that idea of putting that link on that homepage. I do make my students walk through modules and they can't get to the next module, which has, the, you know, the next module until they've completed one. Um, and sometimes they're waiting for me to grade something in order to move on, but they've always got their textbook on that homepage. So they could always go forward with reading the next one. So that be sort of another advantage of having, of having it sort of um, front and center. Suzanne, did you have any thoughts? I feel like this is probably something you've thought about this whole topic. <laughs> I think y'all have covered it. I don't have anything to add. Lots of great ideas. You we know, have a, oh, sorry, I, go ahead. I also want to put in a plug for um, one of the ideas that Suzanne shared, which is embedding the reading in the assignment. Um, I really do love that idea because our students will go through the to-do list and just go straight into the assignment and miss the entire reading if it was up in the module, you know, in that same module, but just up above a few steps. If it's embedded right in the assignment, you know, I I, I would um I, I would um kind of go for putting the entire textbook in module zero or as a redirect, and then again in the assignment. This is the chapter specific for this assignment. Um, I when I've spoken to different instructors and I tell them that after a while they say, you know what, I I've had so much more success because my students are, they now know what to read when they're doing the assignment or what to watch or what website to go to. So I would, I really want to put a plug in for that idea. And I just want to, before we turn next two questions, I just want to point out something that Lindsay brought up in the chat, which is that the question also includes specific A9 direction. Tell your students your intention and what you think they should be looking for in the link. I saw that Ying had her hand up, then Mandy. Thank you. And I think actually Sochi just pretty much just answered the question I was going to ask. But um, 
So Michelle, um, I mean, you went through the embed, especially the embedding and also the redirect too, right? So you went through the plus and minuses for each uh, approach fairly quickly. And, um, and I was just thinking like in kind of summary, what's the best practice? So let's say I have a OER textbook in LibreText. And I know that that OER textbook is is fully accessible and stuff. And now I'm I'm just redesigning a new course. What would any of you guys, you know, what would you do if it's just starting from brand new? It, it's a fully accessible OER textbook. What would you recommend? I think you may have noticed that um, some kinds of embedding were samples that were clearly Suzanne's and some kinds of embeddings were samples that were clearly me. And so that just sort of shows just our different preferences, but we're both beginning with that notion of how do you make sure your students know where they're going and why they're there and so forth. And I think, I think you just have to lean into those most effective practices and focus on what, what makes sense to, um, to how you teach and how you think. Um, although I, 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 I discovering that lots of my colleagues do like the embedding within the page, though, when you see those bad examples of embedding within the page, the page that can make you really, really afraid of that. Um, but I'm actually thinking I, I'm really liking the idea of when the student goes straight to that quiz that they should not be opening until they've read the chapter, having the link to the chapter right there, you know, by the way, you're here. Did you read this yet? Um, I think that's of value. So I think I think it's a lot of I think it's personal preference. But I also I think if somebody was just starting out, I'd say try it a couple ways and figure out what works best for your students. Because who knows? And yeah, Mandy uh -huh. also Mandy also had her hand up as well and's been waiting patiently. But Michelle, it seemed like you were about to add in something to that. Well, I just wanted to add, add one more thing to to Yang's, and then Mandy, we can. Sorry, just um, just a quick plug for backwards design, right? So rather than asking which strategy works best, think about what am I trying to accomplish, and which of these works best for for that. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Mandy. Thanks. So my question has to do with in converting courses to ZTC, um, and I guess this is probably more for like the OER coordinators in the room or the people who have like crossover experience. But like what's your experience with um, converting courses to ZTC, um, ones that are taught online and getting that course poker certified? Any like ideas or processes or experience with, with that? So I... I don't know if others have have thoughts, but I recently took my course through poker certification and it has the, you know, has my labor textbook in it. Um, and really there wasn't a question of, how do I want to say this? I was just focusing on poker. So I, I did, I did my, my ZTC, however I did it. And then really I was focusing on making sure to meet, meet those guidelines and having the ZTC shouldn't really affect it unless I'm misunderstanding the question. Um, I guess it's like, if if we want to get more courses poker certified, um, how do we sort of band together a little bit and get those ZTC courses that were, or those courses we're converting over to ZTC to also be poker certified? So I think it's just, I, I, I want to um, kind of piggyback on what Suzanne said, I think it's really a matter of just when you're building the course, have the rubric in mind. And um, that's, that's the point. Like, um, if we have a, a person that has never gone through the poker rubric, like, just, I, I just looking for ideas of like, what, what have you done or thought about doing, like to um, try to keep that rubric in mind? Like, do you show it to faculty beforehand and say, here you go, here's this crazy document. <laughs> so so I don't think um, I don't think showing the rubric to an instructor that that is new, like that they're just they're just building their online course. I don't think that rubric is gonna make any sense to them. I think it's um it's it's with that faculty preparation, it's are they going through like uh, OTD with at one or uh, something similar that the college has adopted themselves and created themselves. Um, so going through that course 
Um, and I don't know if your college has an in-house course, Mandy, that has instructors like talk about course design, what's accessibility, you know, objectives, well, you know, all of that stuff. As, I, as I've emailed you about like where our poker funding is is in jeopardy, um, I have a meeting about that right after this in about five minutes. So cross your fingers for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, Michelle. Michelle. I have, I, I would say do a show and tell, have a, have a faculty member try to navigate a course that's not well designed and have them try, then have them have that student experience of a good experience and a bad experience. Cause if you've looked at lots of courses, you know, you look at a course and some courses and you're like, how does a student navigate this? I'm a teacher. I know what's on the teacher's brain and I can't figure out how to navigate it. Whereas a well-designed student anyone can walk in there and figure out how to navigate it because they've done it right and it's clear. And so I think if you're showing them the rubric's going to confuse them, but if you show here's here's something that's here's a course that's been developed with with design in mind and good practices and and see and have them see that difference and you know which course do you want your course to be that one that students can figure out or that one where students are banging their heads on the wall or even your colleagues as they try to look at it are not able to navigate it. And Mandy, I'll end with, um, again, the faculty preparation in in in, a, in designing a course is key, whether it's ZTC or it's not ZTC, because even if the instructor is using a book that's not ZTC, they have to include instructions. Like you have to read this chapter or this part of the book to complete this assignment. Um, right. So I think the instructor preparation, that's important because embedding OER or linking out to OER, it follows the same um the, the same kind of alignment for any Definitely. kind of embedded material. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good luck in your meeting, Mandy. Thanks. <laughs> Dinesh, would you like do you have a question? Yeah, hi. Yeah, real quickly. I don't know if this is helpful, Mandy, as well. Like, you know, think taxonomy and think in terms of uh you know, the course objectives that are present for the course itself and then building out um, the week assignments with course objectives in mind. And um, and as you focus on implementing uh, text or ZTC uh, or content that are free to students, uh, always come back to the objectives that you're trying to satisfy for the students and, and, and taking a look at those, you know, quizzes or exams that you're pre- uh, have pre-organized to make sure that the content relates to that and that students are actually getting the learning that is needed, um, you know, before, you know, not, not necessarily the assessment itself for the sake of assessment, but making sure that the assessment is serving the learning that and the objectives that you are actually looking to meet for the course uh, that you are designing. Uh, lastly, one of the things I wanted to mention is that, you know, the uh, uh, in, in embedding text, uh, also keep in mind that you do have uh, notes uh, in most of your computers as simple text. Feel free to go ahead and copy and paste because many times the, there's a formatting issues that may arise. So uh, cut and paste right into notes and then copy and then paste it back into Canvas. Uh, this way you get simple uh, text uh, where you can format right into Canvas itself and hyperlink as you wish to go ahead and uh, move students around to content that is important. That's an excellent tip too, Dinesh. I often do the same to strip out any of the weird back end yeah. formatting that I don't see. I'll put it in Notepad or Notepad Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, so just want to acknowledge something before we wrap up that Jennifer pointed out that there's a being a, there's a session being offered at OTC on how the, how I believe San Joaquin Delta does poker plus OER. So for those of you going to OTC in a couple of weeks, that'll be a useful session to attend. Anyway, we're coming to the end of our time, so I just wanted to point out a few things. First off, thank you all very much for attending the webinar and giving all three facilitators your attention and asking some really great questions here. We know that summer brain is a thing. I We're on quarters here at De Anza, but it's week 10 for us, and I think everyone's just kind of running on fumes, so we really appreciate you coming here. 
I did post the sur post uh, the survey in chat a couple of times. I'll post it one more time just in case it scrolled off because we had a lot of great comments. But I'm also going to link out to our spring 2024 webinar series that CBC Out One's been holding. I don't know if Suzanne or Michelle want to put a plug for any OERI stuff in there as well, but please plug that in the chat for folks as well. And our, on the webinar page that I posted, you also will see a whole host of different types of webinars from things on RSI to some things on accessibility. You'll even see Suzanne on there a couple of times as well. She did some webinars for us, so lots of great content on there. Again, we really appreciate you all showing up. And as I noted at the start, we'll try our best to have the webinar and associated slides up, the recording of this within a week. So if you knew someone that wanted to attend but couldn't quite make it, please direct them to that. I'll stop right. the recording now and I hope that you all have a great rest of your afternoon. All right, thank you all, appreciate it.